Well, folks, you know you're for a treat when you hear that tune. So it's time for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Reed, Bluff Storini in the home game and at Rec Poker Jim on Twitter. And I have the best freaking job in the world uh, talking poker with my friends here on the Strategy Forums edition of the podcast every Monday night while we steal each other's chips in the nightly home game. Now, I have to mention we're brought to you by the Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Casino. They are the official sponsor of the Rec Poker Podcast. And they're located less than an hour north of the Twin Cities in the beautiful state of Minnesota. You can find out more about them by going to runaces.com. And uh, most of what we do here is free. We're a largely volunteer-based organization. So we really depend on the support of uh, our sponsors and our fantastic premium members. You're going to meet uh, one of them a little later on today. Uh, and if you're interested in getting involved with Rec Poker, come sign up for a free account today. All it takes is an email address and a smile, although we do insist on both. And if you do want to take your membership to the next level and, uh, you know, get more involved, learn more about poker, uh, get involved in our training materials, our study sessions, um, our fantastic uh, uh, social events, all the great stuff that we do here at Rec Poker. Um, it's only 15 bucks a month, and you can get your first month for only $5 by using the code RECPOKER at checkout. So I encourage you to give that a try. Now, they let me host the show on Mondays, but I'm just one man. It takes a group, a gang, a crew to make the magic happen over here. And if you want to find out more about me and the rest of what we call the Wrecking Crew, uh, you can head on over to rec.poker slash crew, or just listen up. You're going to meet a few of them right here on the show tonight. Take it away, gang. I'm Chris Jones. You can find me 5b5 on Twitter or 5 by 5 in the Poker Stars home game. And I run our monthly deep dive strategy segment. I'm Kim Kilroy. I'm Pat that Pat that 33 on social media. I am Fergie 56 in the home game. And I run a hand history review uh, once a month, second Wednesday in the month. And I'm Rob Washam. You can find me as Rabman50 just about everywhere. And on the first and third Wednesdays of every month, you can join me and a bunch of our premium members as we discuss the latest poker book. I'm Taylor Moss. You can find me on Twitter at Taylor underscore Moss or as GopherBoyTJM in the Rec Poker home game, which I stream live on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. Uh, so come check us out at twitch.tv slash Rec Poker. As you can see, just a little smattering of the smorgasbord of options that we have here with our Wrecking Crew offerings um, is one of the one of the reasons we like our premium members to get involved is you can come and join the forums edition of the show. Every once in a while, we get to make a new friend. I'm happy to be joined by premium member Joe Malay, who's been here in the show before. Joe, please introduce yourselves to uh, Rec Poker Nation. Hi, my name is Joe Malay, and uh, I am J.M. Atapi in the Poker home game. Thanks for joining us, Joe. You've uh, been a welcome addition to the forums uh, episodes over the last little while. It's great to hear from you. We're going to be looking at a hand today that uh, our own Chris Jones played in an online tournament just the other day that uh, just got him thinking. And he said to himself, you know, I got to bring this to the wrecking crew and the wreck poker audience and see if we can hash it out. So Chris, tell us a little bit about uh, what made you decide to bring this spot in for the forums edition of the Rec Poker podcast? Uh, well, you ever have hands where uh, it works out really well, but you're not sure if it should have? <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that's, is there any other guy? <laughs> that's uh, that's this hand. So, um, spoiler alert, uh, this is going to go well for us, but uh, um, unspoiler alert, I'm not sure if it should have even got to the point where it did. So, um, we are playing a an ACR tournament. Uh, registration has closed. We are not in the money, and it is not really close to the bubble. So, um, it's kind of that phase of the tournament. If you're kind of like you're kind of like you're kind of feeling your way out, trying to like work your way down what I call the funnel, basically of the tournament, where like nobody else is entering, and you're trying to winnow your way down to get to a good spot. Um, we're at a table where uh, I'm just looking at it right now. All, all the stacks are, you know, this is kind of also the stage of the tournament where chips are really distributed and they're pretty low. There's been a lot of last minute entries. 
Um, I myself late regged this tournament pretty max late regged it. So um, there's a lot of like 20 to 10 to 20 big blind stacks. The biggest stack at our table has 28. Uh, we have uh, 14 and a half big blinds. Um, and there's a lot of stacks in that 10 to 20 range. Um, and it is on us uh, in the low jack. And we have ace, 10 of clubs. Again, I've got 14 and a half big blinds. And I just open, min open this hand. Um, Chris, there, uh, usually when stacks sort of get down to this size, you start seeing players start to shove you know more widely than they had been before at this point in the tournament in particular can you sort of speak a little bit about like what that dynamic was and uh was it sort of like a uh were a lot of pots getting to showdown or or was it a lot of like opening and three betting uh it's more i would say you know typical kind of acr tournament was a lot of aggressive uh, opening i was planning to mostly open call off with this if i got shoved on um it's you know it's it's not the best hand but strong enough um i i and i i've been really trying to not just open shove when i've got this much this many chips with that i do it with some of the weaker small pairs and a few other holdings like this but like a suited ace 10 I just feel like it it has playability. I like to open it. So that's was my decision there. But oh, I mean, sorry, what position were you again? Uh low jack. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I I I also kind of struggle a little bit with when to min open and when to shove with spots like this. I'm sure it's a solved, I mean, you know, we could look it up <laughs> according to the assumptions that you put in there. But um, does anyone here, Taylor, do you have something to add on that? Yeah, I was going to say, I think this is common for people to be like, hey, 10, should I shove? Should I open? Like, how do I feel about that? The way that I think about these spots is I think about like, what would my opponent call off for 14 big blinds and like start thinking through those things. And then you start going through this and you're like, are they going to call off like ace eight offsuit? Probably not. Um, so like, those are like the types of hands. It's like, okay, like I'm thinking about that. And it's like, what? Well, how do I want ace eight offsuit to react to my open with ace 10 suited well i'd much rather they think that they have fold equity and are going to jam into us and then we can call off and get a you know in a pot against ace eight uh whereas if we jam we're going to get them to fold so that can also work out with how chris was talking about this like i heard him say like low pocket pairs like if you have threes here that's an appealing jam to me because if your opponent has fours five sixes they're likely going to fold to a jam but would do the inverse of that. Like if you min open, they may just rejam over the top of you. And then you're stuck trying to call off with threes in that spot where you're potentially um, not doing very well. So that's how I think about those types of opens. Cause I think this is really common for people to not understand like, oh, 14, I should just always jam. No, I think you can mix some things in there and like start thinking about these hands and how you want them to play and how your opponent could potentially react. Yeah, Rob, you unmuted there too. What's on your mind? Yeah, I think there's been a migration, I think, in the last few years where when we get down underneath that 20 big blind, it, in the past, it was always, okay, I'm just going to jam. If I get a good hand, I'm just going to jam. And I think there's been this migration where you get to these types of stack depths now, and you see that min open. And I think it's, I think it's very... Um, effective because you get to see how the rest of the table reacts before you commit the rest of your stack. Now there's times where you could call off and there's other times where you see a couple of players get active and you say, well, I think I'm just going to give up on this one now. And you're not committing your stack and you're allowing your opponents to make mistakes mm. that you are not making. So I think you know, I've, I've seen this more and more, and I've incorporated this a lot more into my game also, where I'll do a lot more min opening at those stack depths. And and I know Chris has a specific hand that we played, but I'm kind of curious in, in taking this just a little further. How important is it for us to have a balanced opening range here where, like, I guess we could say we, we're going to min open because if it goes like min open, raise, shove, shove, then we can obviously fold and get out of the way. But are we going to have hands that we're planning to open and fold to a single 
raise in our opening range as well? And are they just just worse? Uh, I mean, I guess you could say, for instance, like uh, worse worse aces uh, that still have a blocker, but you're folding to a raise. Or uh, Chris, tell me a little bit about that well, kind of and range even, construction. I mean, even like um, I would probably, I mean, I don't even know if this is probably not right on the charts, but I, I think I would be thinking of this like ace 10 off. I'm probably open mm -hmm. folding and ace 10 suited. I'm probably open calling. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of even that level of distinction uh, for me, but certainly like a hand like king 10, um, the suited versus unsuited variety is one that I'm going to open both and I'm going to call off with the suited probably depending on who it is. Yep. Do you, do we have any limps at this stack size? We probably should. I do not okay. have any limps, but this um, feels like it. But we probably should. If if we did, would this be the kind of hand that can make the nuts that can stand to call if it gets raised, or is it just too strong for that, and we should be two xing? The thing that makes me say no limping here is our position that we're in is there's so many people that can raise small or relimp behind us and have position on us. I think some of the benefits of limping we'll see will come from a shorter stack size kind of like this, but then when we're on the button, maybe mm -hmm. even the cutoff, uh, and then we're able to capitalize on position and kind of lower that. Um, it also depends on the stage of the tournament that we're in. I think Chris is in a pretty good stage of the tournament for limping to be viable. Like, getting near the money bubble uh, and kind of approaching some sort of higher ICM pressure. But I, I just think the position is too poor for us to consider limping. Yeah, I was more thinking about this would be a hand that might fall into a limp and then back shove versus a raise mm -hmm. versus one razor. Mm -hmm. Like this is sort of the bottom of our range for doing that way. Yep, I like that. And I like that we're being thoughtful about covering our bases in spots like that, because, you know, when we take exploitative lines, we open ourselves up to be exploited. So uh, being thoughtful about what we're going to do, looking down the road a bit is, is crucial there. Okay. Found a couple rabbit holes already. So we, <laughs> uh, our hero, uh, Chris Jones, you make the two X open from the low Jack. What happens next? So we have ace, 10 of clubs folds around to the big blind who has 12 and a half big blinds. So we cover them by two. Um, they are a fairly uh, aggro player, um, have, uh, you know, a 15% three bet uh, number. They're um, somebody who um, is C betting almost all the time when they bet, uh, defending fairly regularly. They've defended 77% of their big blinds. I have over 250 hands on them so not a ton right. but a, a decent number where we're kind of have a sense that this is a player that likes to play pots anyway they call so awesome we uh go to a flop uh against this opponent uh flop is two of spades jack of clubs seven of spades um they check to us and we're we have a Backdoor straight flush draw, or backdoor royal flush, uh, backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draw. Uh, we have an ace. Um, Fox. We have, <laughs> we have, um, what do we got now? We've got 12 and a half bigs and they've, they're sitting there with like 10, 10 and a half. And, and we put into, they called two, there's one for the ante. And it's five and a half in the middle, yeah. Half for the small blind, so five and a half. So roughly two to one um, SPR here. So I'll defer to the group here, but this feels like, is it jack seven, two, two-tone? Um, yes, two spades. The seven and the deuce are spades, and then the jack is the club. So this feels like we should be We have this. spades, right? We, we have clubs. clubs. So we've got oh, the back door okay. only. Uh, okay. I feel like... It's tricky when stacks get this shallow, but I feel like we should be betting here. Uh, if we do, is it a one and done or are we fine? Uh, yeah, yeah, Taylor, you unmuted there. Talk to me. 
I was going to say, there's a lot of things that I think you can do here. Um, I think the standard would be to bet like really small on this board, like 1.4 big blinds or something like that. Um, you know, a quarter pot or somewhere around there, uh, just because opponent is going to have to play like really face up versus us. Uh, it, it may be 1.4 big blinds, but that's a, a good chunk of their stack. Like they're not going to have much left uh, afterwards. And it's still, if we take this line very frequently, we still have all of our strong holdings uh, within there and we can fire a lot on turns and, you know, continue the aggression. So I don't think it's a one or done. Um, I think there is a potential for us to consider a bigger bet and by a bigger bet, I mean, maybe like three and a half, four big blinds and taking a one and done type of approach. However, it really stinks when we get like jammed on and we put mm -hmm. in three bigs and then they put in 10 and we have to just fold, uh, knowing we have backdoor equity. So personally, I don't like that line. I would be going small and I don't think check is out of the line mm -hmm. entirely, but I do lean way more heavily towards just a really small bet here. We the stacks are so short that we we can still get them in on the river if we check here and it runs out well for us. And there are a lot of good runouts for us, right? Clubs and and Broadway. Uh mm -hmm. and I do like and the idea of being able to like to to put chips in on a future street. Sorry, Taylor, what were you saying? I was just going to say, I, and, but I do want to like throw caution because uh, if I'm big blind in this spot, what I would do versus a uh, like really small C bet here is a really small check raise. I think that is like super threatening. So I, I'm worried about opponent potentially doing that versus us, especially when Chris labeled him uh, as aggressive. But if we go 1.4 and opponent raises to 3.1 or something like that like how are we going to react mm -hmm. it's really troubling for us to to react to that uh so i am kind of worried about that yeah rob you unmuted there no i i was just gonna say i agree with taylor um i think a 1.4 1.5 the blind bet is probably how i would proceed uh and like he said a check is maybe okay also because the description of the opponent is that he's very aggressive. So he could definitely make him, you know, we're down betting from our original open and he could take that as, you know, showing weakness and just see betting with anything we have and take that as a, as a sign that he can be aggressive towards us to try to get us to fold. So we're not getting as much of the right information as we normally would in this spot because the chip stacks are so small, you know, mm -hmm. normally in this spot, you, you get called and you go, okay, well, he's, he's either a non-believer or he's, he's got some bit of that flop, but you know, in this case, it's like, you know, we're, we're going for stacks, either his, you know, his stack or not. So yeah, it's a very, Tough. I could I could go either way, a small bet or a check. Yeah. And I think if if he just turned around and three bet me, I'd probably jam over the top of him. Mm. Because I don't think I could believe him based on the stats that we have. I think his range is so much wider than a normal, you know, tight player making the same move. But I think we could if we bet small, we get a small three bet on top or a raise on top check raise on top we can just go ahead and jam yeah it's hard for us to be dead here no matter how strong their holdings right. are even right. though we can be behind um just given the given the run out, or given the board it's, it's hard for us to be completely dead um my only this is something that occurs to me in spots like this if we do check here are we like opening the door are we like waving the red flag for them to lead out on the turn with a bunch of hands that we're behind and I think if it's not a club or Broadway, we probably have to fold to that lead because now we only have one card to come and we know that we're not making any of our back doors. Is that something we should be worried about? I mean, it's kind of true if we um, just make the small bet and face the check raises as well. How do you guys deal with that? It's like, this is an aggressive opponent. 
if I check, they can bet. But if I bet, they can check raise. They're both aggressive. So I've been I've been worrying at working on my hand reading skills. I think this is a really good um, question, Jim. But let's turn it over to Chris for a bit. Yeah. Why don't we actually look at the what actually happened and we'll try to answer that question? How about that? Um, I did check. I checked. Um, I I thought because of the aggressive nature of a, the player, I did not want to be check raised because uh, I think if I had ace ten of diamonds here, I think I'm betting right. almost every time. But with the backdoor clubs, I think there's a lot of turn cards that are really intriguing for this hand, and I didn't want to get blown off of it. Um, and we may still have a lot of the time still have the best hand with the ace 10 right now. So I did check. Uh, and funny you should say it. Does it wave some red flag? Um, the uh, turn is the five of hearts. So not one Damn. of the cards that we are really hoping for. Exactly the kind of situation you were describing. Our opponent, again, off a 10 and a half big blind stack. We are sitting there with 12 and a half. They bet. 1.25 big blinds. <laughs> That's gross. That's so gross. So this is just what we were talking about, right? Like when stacks get short like this, you can leverage a lot of your opponent's stack with these really small bets. This, I, I mean, it looks strong. It's one of those things where it's like, do they think they have full equity here? Because it's <laughs> it, it looks like a milking bet, doesn't it? Like uh what would it be? A, a a jack, like eight nine or nine ten of spades or something like that would probably go bigger. Um, I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> um, I just want to point out that I, this is episode I don't know six hundred and something of the podcast, and I'm still rooting for clubs or Broadway to come. When Chris is like, he he tells what the next card is five of hearts. I'm like, I'm I'm honestly heartbroken. That it was the five of hearts. They're like, damn it! I really wanted Chris to hit a club or a or a Broadway here. Anyway, sorry, Taylor, you're saying. Yeah, I think this is interesting. I think the one thing that I would not do here is fold. Um, right. I think we're continuing in some sort of way. We have ace high here versus a big blind range. Um, if they can find this with a, a lot of air, which they're aggressive opponent. Uh, we we called that out like we know this is possible that they could just kind of turn air into a bluff here I think we have to be defending I think we can even consider a raise uh, kind of for the reasons that Rob mentioned before like just not going to believe them when when they kind of do something like this um, we can still represent some pretty good hands because I think when we check back on the flop, we do have some pretty good hands when stack sizes are this short and we don't have to worry about going for three streets to get stacks in. We really only have to worry about two streets. And this could be essentially a pre-blocker bet in a sense for an opponent that maybe is holding bottom pair or something along those types of lines where we could raise and really start to put them in some troubling spots instead of letting them dictate how this hand plays out so i don't mind a raise i think my first inclination is to just call uh in this spot but i don't think i'm folding not with ace high here chris you're nodding along what's on your mind uh i agree i i considered the raise uh ultimately i felt like um this was a this was a i think this is a really big decision point like we are either we either have to start saying, okay, I want to try to get a deuce to fold here. Um, and I want to, and I want to turn my hand into a bluff or my ACE has value. This player is very aggressive and they, and what I think if, if I call this, I have to make the decision that on good river cards, I may have to just grit my teeth and because now I've left their bluffs in by calling them here, grit my teeth and hang on and try to win with ace high, I think is what we're doing when we're calling. I mean, there's going to be some bad river cards. Where we're going to have to change that plan. But that I think I either am raising to try to get them off some of those kind of like weaker holdings that are beating me. Or I'm like, this hand's still pretty good. It's, it still might have some value. And I'm just going to hang on for dear life. What do you think are good river cards 
for us. That, yeah. Because we're we're now at a point where I, there's two spades out there. So spades are potentially not that great. But other than that, because I think that's another important piece uh, for people as we're listening to this, like what are the good river cards that we are going to potentially hero on? What are the bad ones that we might, even though we think we're ahead now, might turn us into a fold on the river? Yeah, I think spades are, I think potentially uh, the next worst cards are the ones that are the like straightening cards um, kind of around the seven and the five, probably that, that really hammers the big blind range. Um, but I think even those eight like, is like the yeah. worst one, right? Yeah. 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 Like eight right. is bad. Six is bad. Nine is bad. Um, those types of things. Yeah. I think those are the bad ones. The good ones uh, outside of an ace or a 10, right? Like Kings aren't that bad. Jacks are pretty darn good Jacks for us good. here. Um, even potentially the deuce, even though we think they might have a deuce, but that might help us kind of understand where they're at. I, like, I don't mind board pairs and I don't mind um, kings and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And maybe like threes and fours or like some of those, the very bottom end. Yeah, threes probably all right. Probably safe, but yep. yeah, we're getting into the orange territory on the heat map, though. For <laughs> yeah, no, I think good... th- I think three feels relatively safe. Yeah. Okay, good question. I like that exercise. And yeah, we, I mean, too. listen, we're we're facing we're getting pretty good odds here to call and see a card in position. Like we get to close mm-hmm. the action. It's a small bet. Um, so it's it's definitely they definitely have a lot of worse hands that are making this bet. I think. If if that's all we needed to know, I think I think we know that. But you're right, Chris. I think we're gonna expect to see some some fireworks on the river. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts on the turn? So we do call hero calls. Is that uh, what hero I'm hearing? Calls. Hero calls. Hero right. decides to call. Whether I don't know if that's the right decision. Okay. Um, well, I'm glad we had that exercise. Okay. So uh, again, the board is deuce of spades, jack of clubs, seven of spades five of hearts and the river is the four of hearts Mm. and villain shoves. Oh, Jack seven, five, four, two. You Taylor, you unmuted. Yeah. I I mean, I unmuted to go. Oh, because I was like, I'm really glad I didn't chime in because right before we got to the turn and you were talking about fireworks, I was like, I honestly don't expect much fireworks. Uh, They're probably just going to continue for like half their stack at most and then like leave it at that. But no, an all in size uh, is definitely interesting uh, for them here. They're going very polar with what they're saying. So I think that's really like worth Mm -hmm. contemplating because it really to me feels like a jack or nothing or they had some random junk that got there so what would be three six mm-hmm. five four maybe even like uh, yeah like a two pair type of thing like i don't know my radar is up on this one in terms of uh thinking they might be full of it they could have they definitely could have backed into some two pairs here. Like mm-hmm. you could see like five four uh to seven four call. Yeah, probably. Um do you go for everything though with two pair? I think that's part of like what I struggle with is like we went 1.25. Did we only right. have one pair then and then we hit two pair on the river? Like 1.25 does not feel like a two pair bet on the turn. So Part of this is like the story isn't like making chronological sense to me. And we haven't we haven't demonstrated a lot of strength ourselves. So if they were value betting, it's not clear to me that we've told them, oh, we have a jack. Like we'll call a big bet. You know what I mean? So that that also mm-hmm. makes me think there, there are a lot of bluffs in there. Here, Rob, you uh, you unmuted. Yeah, I think um let's took Take a look again at the player type that we're talking about here. Um, the fact that he bet on the turn means absolutely nothing about the strength of his hand. <laughs> you know, he's sitting there with with Queen Six, you know, offsuit. 
it doesn't mean anything about the strength of his hand because we check. As soon as we check right. the flop, that gave him the green light to say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and bet. And then he bet the turn, and all we did was call. And so now another card that totally whiffed our range. Let's not talk about how it might have hit his range. Let's talk about how it totally whiffed our range, right? There's no way we have a four in our hand. So this gave him license to just jam that queen six, saying, well, he doesn't have anything, and this four definitely didn't help him. So I'm going to make him fold. Bet is I'm going to make him fold. If he was really strong, he would be making a bet that would try to get called right? or try to get you to go over the top of him. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I don't know if that's right thinking, but that's kind of the way I kind of approach some of these spots because they are so bizarre. They're just not, you know, the ranges are, his range is really wide because he plays a lot and he's very aggressive. Our range is pretty well uncapped, but based on the way we played it, we played it very weakly. So he can take that aggressive thing that he likes to do and jam it down our throat and try to get us to fold. So I think we have to call. With, so, he, and he has queen six. He has queen six. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's look at some of the bluff combos that they might have. Because I think that some of the two pairs, I think the straight comes in, you know, they could have slow played a set, I guess. I I think we can discount some of those, but um, so they get, so any, any two spade, right. Any two spade would be firing here. I think some of those like eight, nine hands, the seven, eight hands um, that missed their straight draw, they'd be firing anything. Are they turning a pair of twos into a bluff here or something like that? I mean, we have kind of capped our range just by calling the small bet on the turn, but um, feels like they can choose a better hand than that. A as we're talking about it, I mean, I feel like there's enough bluff combos out there. Combine that with the player type. A four was one of the safer cards in my mind. Um, it was in that like orange zone, but that put all that together that kind of inclines inclines me to uh a crying call does anyone else have any thoughts before chris uh fills us in taylor no i i agree with that i think uh i agree with a lot of what rob was saying kind of like identifying like what are they trying to do are they attacking us in those different spots the only thing that like i think gives a lot of weight in my opinion is that turn bet and that turn bet size uh because if like they're now making a play on the river to try and get everything. If they had something hmm. on the turn trying to get something, I feel like they size their bet better to make it easier for them to get everything. Because right now this went from like tiny bet to big bet uh, for them to make on turn and river. I think a lot of players will size it up where it's like medium, medium on turn and river to try and get things. So in other words, going two and a half on the turn to jam what would that be then like eight uh yeah, on the river yeah, seven and yeah. a half eight like that's a much more easy geometric shift to make where they go 1.25 to nine nine yeah uh is a a bigger size where it doesn't feel like it's value to me and maybe i'm reading too much into like how i perceive bet sizing to go through for myself and projecting that onto my opponent but to me that's the part that's really getting me hung up on here and then when i think about like what are their potential value for taking those types of lines it's just a lot of like two pair stuff that hit that four on the river which i don't know like how much of that there is like are they going to defend deuce four from the big blind I don't know, you know, the five, four, probably the seven, four, maybe a little bit more. So um, maybe a Jack four suited, but it's like, there's so few combos. There's the three sixes that potentially exist out there. Cause that could make uh, some decent sense, but otherwise I think they just have a whole lot of other stuff that could potentially be making this play where I'm going to just end up, I think crying call this, but I, I, 
I think it's a lot based on the opponent, the line that they took, and then also just kind of like a, you probably can't call this all the time, but, you know, maybe if two thirds of the time, three fourths of the time, we can find a call when we don't hold a spade and stuff like that. I, I do really like the point you make about the sizing, Taylor, because what they've done is they've chosen a very small sizing on the turn that sets up, I think, just like a bit of an overbet uh, relative to the pot on the river. And as you point out, they could have just bet a little bit bigger on the turn. And because of the geometric uh, uh, properties of bet sizing, they would have a, a much more sort of like mainstream, reasonable bet size to shove on the river. Um and that would be a more value heavy line. So this does feel like they've saved yeah. that over bet as a bluffing option. Because if you've got Jack five here or, you know, whatever two pair on the turn, like we're not making 1.25 our bet size here, right. right? We're going a little bit bigger. We're, we're trying to make it easier because we're already trying to eye up like the whole stack. Right. It feels like very much the plan out of our opponent was take a small stab, just see if I can get an auto fold from my opponent. And then when we don't right. get, they don't get raised on the turn. Now they're at the spot and they're like, this couldn't help us. And then like the same thing Rob was talking about, they may just be making this play. It's like, there's no way this helps them. And if they didn't raise, they didn't bet on the flop and they didn't raise me on the turn. Of course I can, you know, just jam and get them to fold their ace highs and no pair hands. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Chris, how yeah. are you feeling? What, what I, you this thinking? is exact. I mean, I'm really glad to have this conversation. And to me, the sizing was one too that really like had me like because I just felt like if this player had Jack Ten or something like that, like I just feel like a lot of player types, especially aggressive players, have this sense of there are two spades on the board. It's kind of a straighty board in some ways. Um, I want to charge the draws. I want to push them off some of that stuff. I don't want to make it easy for spades to just like auto call me in this spot. So I just felt like a Jack is going to size up. And if they don't have a Jack here, then they just have this kind of weird two pair stuff that we've been talking about. Um, so I, 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 I just elected to call too. So um I called and like I said at the beginning, it worked out well. Uh, any guesses? Rob says queen six. I think it's like eight, seven, nine, seven. Well, eight, that beats nine. us. So that's terrible. What? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Eight, eight, uh, eight, eight nine, nine. Ten, nine. I yeah, feel like they have an eight in their hand. I'm going to guess uh, 10, eight offsuit. Eight. Yeah. Any other guesses? All right. Again, Real? uh, Deuce of spades, jack of clubs, seven of spades, five of hearts, four of hearts, ten three of hearts. Oh, okay. <laughs> was I there a heart? There was not a heart on the flop, but... Uh... Well, there was two hearts, but they were the last two cards, so... Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it wouldn't have mattered at that point. Right, right. So they had, they had nothing going for them on the turn even yeah right and that makes sense with it like again it was like a small stab yeah. trying to like just get some like queen highs to fold or king highs to fold versus this uh and then they got to that spot on the river and they're like well i can't win with this and my opponent hasn't shown anything i can get him to fold over cards or mm -hmm. higher high card hands mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep i mean I he, they're not wrong they, <laughs> like a lot of people fold i, mean, I, I almost folded Chris's this issues. so you know yeah uh, no exactly um so what do you guys think about this because I, I i i'm in this spot from time to time and you know i like to bluff i like to make people full um i'm a red line player and there's only two ways that i kind of think about bluffing i can either do it when i have a good hand uh that that has you know card removal qualities or blocker qualities for my opponent or I can just do it where like it's a good spot because they've demonstrated weakness and whether I have a good hand or not, it's like they're weak. I should try bluffing here. What do you guys think about that? Like choosing the times to bluff, how important is it to have a hand in your, a card in your hand that's a good bluffing candidate and how important is it to just 
sort of feel weakness and go for it. Chris, you've uh, you're the only unmuted player, so I'll ask you first. I mean, I think that's a little bit like between like like a a feel player versus a a like a, a GTO or like a math player. Like to me, you want to start with the theory, which is the blocker quality, and to have those good cards in your range to make sure that you've got like. You know, on this board, like like the fact that we don't have spades makes this a much easier call. But I think if if we're, you know, our opponent making this play, we probably don't want to do it as much with two spades. Like that might be one where we want to pull back. And so like those things I think are really good to at least have in your head. So you know what makes good bluffs theoretically. But if you've got a read that somebody's like weak and you've got a terrible, like if I had if I had two spades on this this if i had ace 10 can i have ace 10 of spades yes i can yes yeah yes. yeah you could so if i had ace 10 of spades here this hand would have played out differently but let's just say i did um and i've just got to read that this guy is just like there's just there's just so much over bluffing here then i think you can push yourself towards a call even if you got the wrong cards right that's i guess my take yeah uh rob yeah when it, when it comes to bluffing it's it's interesting to think about because i'm usually doing some semi bluffing you know on the flop and on the turn and then when we get to the river that's where you have to make that decision mm -hmm. is this a spot where i can actually pull off the triple barrel or whatever it is and i think some of those determinations like blockers and and what you think your opponent is holding come into play quite a bit but they're just very small uh nuances that you can't really depend on f to make your decision you know it might help a little bit but it's not really something that you should be thinking about and so i like what chris said about the read on your opponent and then when you're doing that you're going to say okay what hands that he beats me with and I get him to fold and then go back through your, you know, your train of thought to what are the hands that you put him on and what is, does his range include enough of those types of hands that you can bluff him? So I think it has a lot to do with the previous action. I think Taylor mentioned that when we were talking earlier that, you know, based on the previous action is going to tell you uh, where you, where you stand and what the strength of your hand looks like. So that's really how I do it more than anything else. And if I can't come up with that hand that I can make fold with a bluff, then I probably won't try it. <laughs> I like that. It's true that like, even if you have good combos in your hand, you should still only be semi bluffing against weak ranges, right? Like you should, you shouldn't take it as the, oh, I had the ace of hearts and I was blocking the nut flush. So I had to go for it. Like they're just candidates. Uh, you 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 need to be playing against someone who's capable of folding to a bluff. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how good the carrots in your hand are. Uh, Taylor, you unmuted there. Yeah, I was going to say, we could probably end up talking about this for a really long time uh, if we <laughs> wanted to. But to try and keep it somewhat simple, the things that I think about is, does my story make sense with my bluff? Because when you're bluffing, you're essentially representing some sort of strong hand does my story make sense for that? Do I think my opponent is capable of folding a strong hand, or do I think that their range consists of a lot of hands that are going to fold is going to be the next thing that I ask myself. And then the third thing I'm going to ask is like, do I have relevant cards? And relevant cards may change at different aspects uh, of the hand uh, because you may want to bluff with some equity that you could you know, potentially catch up if you're on the flop or the turn. In which case, in this example that Chris had, spades would be a good hand to be bluffing with uh, on the flop return because if you get called because you were wrong, you can catch up. However, then once you get to the river, it's bad to have spades because you wanted your opponent to have those draws and those hands so that it kind of flips the other way. So it's like, you know, where are you at within the hand and do your hands make sense? Um, so those are the types of things that I think about uh, or things that I think about when it comes to bluffing. I love it, Kim. 
Um, I was going to say, like, I, I don't mind the, the hand the guy picked because he has the three as a blocker. I think a three and a six in your hand in this kind of hand is really good. But I think when you're thinking about blocking, you got to look at what people are thinking about you. So mm -hmm. if I've been, you know, if I've been playing a tight game, then I think this bluff will get through. If I've been had a really good run of cards and happened to be playing a whole bunch of hands, then I think it's way less likely the bluff will get through. So that's what I take into consideration when I'm thinking about bluffing on the river. I love it. Well, that was a really good conversation. Does anyone have any uh, parting thoughts? Chris, kudos on finding the call there. In real time, I think it's harder for us to sort of do this combo count and put ourselves in our opponent's shoes. Um, really valuable exercise to be able to think in advance, like what are the good rivers for me? What are the bad rivers for me? And, and sort of let that help you limit the number of decisions you have to make while that time bank is, uh, is ticking down. Um, all right. Well, great conversation, gang. Uh, if folks are listening to this when it comes out, uh, you've probably still got, I'll, I'll remind folks again, unfortunately, our, we love the folks at Running Aces, but they have had to postpone some of their uh, promotional events over the summer. So Rec Poker Weekend is not happening on August 2nd and 3rd after all, unfortunately, but we'll make it up uh, with another event sometime soon. Um, if you've enjoyed the show and you want to help us out, you can go to rec.poker slash support and find a few ways to help out the show and the group here uh, by subscribing or liking to some things without spending a dime. And of course, there's also a, a chance to spend a dime or even more than a dime supporting the show, which we would also greatly appreciate. Um, head over to rec.poker slash support for that. And if you've enjoyed um, hearing how different members of the Rec and Crew talk about poker, uh, most of our Rec and Crew members offer coaching to, to our members and to our audience. I think you'll find it's uh, probably the best value available out there and um, you can kind of pick who amongst the wrecking crew you'd like to work with. And so head over to rec.poker slash coaching, and you can find some fantastically fun and friendly folks to uh, help take your poker game to the next level. Well, I want to thank uh, Running Aces for their support over the years. Um, thanks to Joe Malay for joining us here in the, uh, in the wrecking crew booth for this forums edition of the podcast. Uh, Chris Jones, Rob Washam, Taylor Moss, and Kim Kilroy. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, thanks to everyone who listens at home and just everyone who's uh, involved with Rec Poker. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next week on the Rec Poker Podcast. Uh, good night. Everybody.